You're listening to the Just Japan Podcast. Everything you want to know about Japan. Kevin here from the Just Japan Podcast, and this is the Just Japan Podcast, episode number 147. The Just Japan Podcast is the weekly podcast that brings you everything all Japan, and this week is just like the other ones. We're talking about Japan.、Um, I live here in Kobe, Japan, with my family, and each week I bring to you a different guest to talk about a different topic that will make you happy. Because if you're listening to this show, you're definitely A Japan person, someone who's interested in Japan. You want to live here, you want to work here, you want to travel here, you're interested in the culture, the history, something. And that's what this podcast is all about. Now, I'm going to keep the intro and outro short this week because I've got some serious issues going on with my voice.、Um, I either have,、um, I'm pretty sure it's some, some pretty crazy allergy issues going on right now.、Uh, my throat hurts a bit, it's scratchy, it's icky. My nose is stuffed up. I sound like I'm talking through my nose.、Um, so, this week we're going to be talking all about sake, Japanese sake. That's right, Nihon Shu, that、uh, alcohol drink that is synonymous with Japan because it's from here. And you know what? It's a topic that I really don't know much about. Occasionally I will have a little bit of, of, of the stuff, but I don't know anything about sake. So, I brought on someone who does. I brought on a sake expert. That's right, Mr. Gordon Hetty. Mr. Gordon Hetty, that's right. So, Gordon、uh, was kind enough to come on the podcast and he, he talked a lot about sake.、Uh, he's going to share all that information with you guys. The man has made sake himself, has worked at Japanese sake breweries, and yeah, he definitely knows his stuff. And I, I learned a lot from this interview, and you're going to learn a lot too. Of course, the Just Japan podcast can be found on all the major podcatchers. Just do a Google search for Just Japan podcast. We're on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Libsyn. iHeartRadio. We're all over the place. Also, go to justjapanstuff.com, justjapanstuff.com. That's the hub for the Just Japan podcast and a lot of other cool Japan related content. I've gotten really active on the blog and have been writing a lot of stuff about Japan and have some really amazing contributors who are doing the same. Also, one thing, I'm recording this on the 1st of March. It should be uploaded on the 2nd of March, and there's just a few days left to get your. Just Japan podcast t shirts. There will be a link in the show notes at justjapanstuff.com to get your Just Japan podcast t shirts over on Teespring. So go check that out.、Um, yeah, so hey, let's just get into things right now and check out my talk with the very impressive Mr. Gordon Hetty, a man who knows a lot about sake. Please hang up and try again. Welcome to episode number 147. Of the podcast, the interview portion. And we're talking all about Japanese sake Nihon Shu tonight. And this evening, I'm very happy to have guest,、uh, first time guest, Gordon Hetty. Thank you for joining Thank us. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's, it's really great for you to come on the podcast.、Um, I stumbled across you on Twitter、um, some time ago when I was actually searching for stuff about sake. And、um, I. I followed you on Twitter and have, I followed some other sake people. And、uh, I was really happy when I reached out to you that you were available to come on the Just Japan podcast and talk about、um, you know, Japan's maybe arguably, possibly, probably the most famous alcohol. <laughs> I think it is. I, I think it is too. Yes, yes. I mean, of course, you know, beer is popular in Japan, but that is、uh, when I think of beer, I don't think of Japan. I tend to think of other countries. But when you think of sake or Nihon Shu, well, there's really one place. <laughs>、um, yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So, Gordon,、um, first of all,、uh, can you tell the Just Japan podcast listeners maybe a little bit about yourself?、Um, you know, where you're from、um, and what brought you to Japan? My hometown is、uh, Portland, Oregon.、Um, I'm 47 years old, and I've spent about 40 of my years living in and around Portland.、Uh, okay. Previously,、uh, How do I say this? 
I've been traveling a, a great deal the last 10 years, most of it in the United States. And my story with sake actually begins as a university student. Okay. I was tutoring Japanese exchange students from Kanto Gakuin University in my alma mater of a, a Linfield College in McMinnville, Oregon. And students started to pay me by giving me a yango bean, a 720 milliliter bottle of sake, instead of money okay. for English language lessons. Uh, so this was my introduction to sake. Uh, <laughs> fast forward uh, nine years after college, there was um, a group of investors um, trying to start a sake brewery in Oregon. Uh, that brewery became known as the Sake One. I became a founding shareholder. I owned a very, very small portion of that brewery, but I became a, a great advocate for sake that's brewed in Oregon. Okay, wow. And that business is still thriving, um, but maybe five years ago, I sold my share of that business, took some time off, and found myself in Kyushu. And I knew a lot about sake, but not a lot about how it was actually made by craftsmen. Okay. And I met a man who owned a brewery, and over dinner, he gave me an invitation to work at his brewery as a Kurabito, a production sake brewery worker. Oh, wow. And that started my odyssey of brewing sake. So the last four winters, I've been making sake as a part-time or full-time job, uh, usually working seasonally. Okay. This is the first year in four seasons that I've not actually brewed sake, and that's because my other job when I'm not brewing is as an English teacher. Okay. I came to Sapporo, Japan to take a job as a teacher, and unfortunately, there's not a lot of sake being brewed in Sapporo, so I'm not brewing sake at this time. <laughs> well, um, so, so when you were living in Kyushu, basically, you would spend the, the, the kind of the brewing, is, is there such a thing as a brewing season? Yes, and it's primarily the fall and the winter. Okay, and that's when Some you were, so, so you were basically you were working um, at sake breweries, um, helping brew the sake during that time of year. Yes. Oh wow, that's awesome. Yeah, and I learned a lot about sake as a result. Um, my language skills aren't very good, but thankfully, the last two master brewers for whom I worked spoke good enough English where they could teach me some of what they knew. Okay, and I would shadow them often doing their their work with them and it was really a phenomenal experience uh, the first three seasons i actually had an apartment inside the brewery so i actually lived inside of the sake brewery during the brewing season oh wow that's a, a, a highlight of my life <laughs> wow that is amazing that's a really cool story so you know you fell in love with with sake because essentially students were were paying you in sake during university and, yes, uh, and um, and then years later in America, you 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 stumble back into or you stumble back into sake again, I suppose, um, or maybe maybe not. You said you you became very interested in it. Um, so you so when you first came to Japan, um, the intention was for you to come here to learn how to make sake. I came as a tourist to visit breweries. Okay, and I didn't have any pretense that I might find a job. But lo and behold, the second sake brewery I visited, the owner of the brewery took a liking to me and offered me a job. I, I wasn't asking for one. He just offered it to me. Oh, wow. So it was a very uh, fateful day in my life. I've got to spend more time hanging around sake breweries. My goodness. Uh, <laughs> because, that, because that sounds like a great job. Um, now, it's interesting. Um, just pre, pre-interview, um, folks out there listening. Um, before uh, before I started recording and, and I first started chatting with, with Gordon, I started kind of a bit telling a little bit of a story. Um, maybe I'll mention that now, but I mean, I live, uh, I don't know, so I don't live in the sake brewing district, but I work in the sake brewing district here in Kobe, Japan, um, not at a brewery, but at a school. But we are surrounded by breweries, and there's a, a great, um, a great, uh, if you ever come to Kobe, Japan, you can pick up at all the, the ma major train stations an actual sake brewery walking map, a walking tour map. And you get off at Hanshin Oishi Station and you just follow this map and you can just hit about a dozen sake breweries. And uh, mind you, of course, you're just going to the gift shops and the museums. But um, it's, it's, I always tell people, if you're coming to Kobe, 
It's free, free admission to the museums, and they have free samples. It's phenomenal. <laughs> it, it, it is phenomenal, and I haven't done it enough. I haven't, <laughs> um, but I, you know, bring good walking shoes and uh, a liver protector. Um, but it's 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 it is awesome. But that's something we can talk about a, a little bit later. Um, okay, so um, for those out there who may not know. Could you, and, and I got to admit, I don't really know much. I mean, I think it was just until recently I kept, I would always say sake was a rice wine, but I've been informed that it's actually more closer to beer than wine. Yes. Okay, um, so could you, well, okay, so you're the guy who knows. I'm, I, I don't really um, at all. So what is Japanese sake? I think it's <laughs> correct to call sake as a unique beverage and Though some people, well-intended, refer to it as rice wine, this is the same as calling a Pinot Noir a, a grape beer or a Hefeweizen a wheat wine. Okay. Uh, these terms don't make any sense to a sake brewer. Sake is sake or Nihonshu is Nihonshu. Mm. It's brewed much like a beer, and because the alcohol content is higher, it's served much like a wine. The alcohol content is typically between 15 to 20 percent, although there are some exceptions. Um, it's made from rice, water, yeast, and a mold called koji. It's also known as Aspergillus orizai. And these are the four primary ingredients to brewing sake. There is another ingredient for sake that is called futsushu or Jozo added sake, I should say, alcohol added sake. Sometimes sake is supplemented or fortified with uh, ethanol. Okay, that, that actually really, oh well, really, okay, so would that be the cheaper sake? Yes. Okay, that sounds like uh, the way that um, in South Korea, the way soju is produced. Um, the kind of mass marketed soju that you'd buy at convenience stores and supermarkets. Um, I, I used to live in Korea. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and ironically enough, and, and from what I gather, a lot of the Korean beer is, is made that way too. Um, and the litmus test uh, for us when I lived there, unfortunately for my wife, um, who you know was, was there at the time as well, she, um, whenever she would drink uh, soju or Korean beer, she would break out in like red blotches on her body. Oh no. But if she drank uh, a Guinness or an Asahi or a Sapporo or a Heineken, not an issue. So, yeah. so we, we, I know I've read, if you go to like a Wikipedia page, I know they, they talk about how, how um, there were rice shortages in Korea during the 80s. And they started to basically, essentially, like the soju you buy in a green bottle, say in Korea, is uh, water, ethanol, and some kind of flavoring. Yes. So I'm, I'm going to assume that ethanol is, uh, but I did not know that Japanese sake, there were types of Japanese sake that were fortified with that. Okay. Yes, and it's it's fortified, but the alcohol content by law um, has to be restrained. And there's a variety of rules depending on the quality of the sake that's made. So it's okay. it's it's regulated. But I think for your listeners, they should know that premium sake is referred to as a Junmai sake, and on the label it would say something like Junmai, Junmai Ginjo, Junmai Dai Ginjo or just Ginjo, or just Daiginjo. Okay. And these grades of sake account for, oh, 24% of the sake that's made. The other 75, 76% is what is known as futsushu, and it's of a lower quality. Okay, so, so, so that's what I've been drinking. Because, uh, <laughs> yeah. to be honest, <laughs> I, I mean, I, um, you know, I, I, I enjoy sake, there's no doubt about that, um, but it's not something I drink often, and it is something, if I do drink it, I'm probably buying, like, one of those, like, 300 milliliter bottles, and, and, yes. and just, you know, have, having a couple of, a couple of small drinks of it. Um, wow, okay, so, um, could you tell us a little bit about the history of sake? When, when was it first made? How was it discovered or created? Where did it come from? What's the, the origin story of sake? Well, the origin story of sake is about 2,000 years old. Uh, rice, as, as far as what I believe, you know, archaeologists or historians can, can lead us to believe, 
came over from the Korean Peninsula, and it was first the, the, the oldest rice paddies they've actually found are in Saga, in Kyushu. Okay. And so this had a lot to do with how Japan moved forward as a society. And as rice started to spread across the country, rice could be used for various religious rituals, like in the Shinto religion. And at that time, rice might have been served like in a bowl. And instead of uh, drinking it, you could, you could eat parts of it as well. Um, an interesting story about the origin of sake has to do with sake that was actually chewed by shrine maidens, if you will. Okay. And there wasn't a lot known about yeast at the time, but the kuchikami sake, it's uh, sake, kuchikami no sake. It's sake that's actually chewed and spit into a pot. And the amylase, which is, I guess, amylase and diastase, they are starch-degrading enzymes that are found in our saliva. This enabled the fermentation to actually occur with naturally occurring yeast. So this kind of a shrine sake was perhaps the oldest sake, and that dates to about 300 BC, I believe. Oh, wow. Okay. And so as... As, as sake grew to become more popular over the last 2,000 years, uh, the Shinto religion and the Buddhist religion have each played a role in the actual brewing of it. And then the Japanese government got involved with regulating it. And it's during the Heian period where I believe in the year 701, the imperial court decided to create a series of laws that regulated what was happening in the sake business, if you will. Okay. And the laws and the rules were codified and written down at this time. And so the technical experts, the people who are actually brewing the sake, these are the, the oldest records I believe that we have about how sake was made. Wow. Uh, monks were making sake in temples and they called the sake sobushu. And sobushu is a very uh, a special kind of sake that might only be used for religious purposes, and the public wasn't actually drinking this sake. Okay. Well, it's really interesting the, the way it works around the world with uh, different countries, different cultures, and this kind of monastic tradition of, of making booze. Um, yeah. When you think about, like, you know, like Trappist beer, Trappist monks, and, and different yes. things like that, you know, there's, uh, there's something there, you know, people who are locked away and... <laughs> I don't know. And, and of course the government gets involved and sometimes a little too frequently. Well, I think so, I think I think that still happens in Japan when it comes to alcohol, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. When you look at the the kind of like uh the taxation system when you when you even like when you think of beer or something I know a little more about and we've definitely had a few people on uh we've had the guys from the Kyoto Brewing Company were on before. Um and we also had um we've had craft beer reviewers on uh before talking about craft beer and uh, the the ta kind of taxation system when it comes to like um, the amount of malt used in beer and why we have beer and we have hapo shu and yes. uh, the difference is not it's 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 pretty confusing when you talk to beer enthusiasts who come from America or Canada you know and 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 just the stumbling blocks that um, you know the, the reason why uh, for example with beer how the craft brewing industry is just something that's just now kind of emerging. Um, because there were a lot of, of kind of you know roadblocks because of government regulations and whatnot. Yes, and even home brewing, I believe that's still illegal, isn't it? Or yes, it is. You can't you can't brew. I think it is, it's illegal to brew beer that is more than one percent alcohol. Wow. I think that's the rule when it comes to home brewing, which you know. So I mean, I think there's a lot of wink, wink, nudge, nudge going on with that. Um, you know, there there is. I'm sure there is a craft brewing scene. Um, or a home brewing scene, but maybe that's not something we'll be we'll be talking about on the podcast unless we mask voices and hide identities. Um, so the, the the origin behind this, Kevin, has to do with uh, taxation. And mm. about 120 years ago, Japan was preparing to go to war with Russia. Okay. And to raise money for this, they created some laws that prohibited uh, the production of what's called a doboroku, like it's, a, it's like a farmhouse style of sake. Okay. Where rice farmers could legally make sake, or virtually anybody could make sake, mm. but because 
it was difficult to tax this, they outlawed this kind of sake. Okay. The, the existing sake brewers were taxed. And from what I recall reading, about 30 or 40 percent of the tax revenue raised at that time to prepare for this war came from taxes on sake. Oh, okay. Well, there we go. There we go. So basically, let's let's. Uh, it's it's easier to just make homebrew illegal than try to tax the thing. Yeah. Stuff, huh? Wow. And I'm sure that just carried over on with all alcohol, right? It did, and then that, you know, that law, and I believe it's the late 1800s, so maybe 1896, 1897, something like that. That law stayed in effect during um, the 20s, the 30s, and the 40s. And that helped create uh, the Japanese uh, wartime economy, I guess. Mm. Wow. So, I mean, it's really interesting. I mean, the, the kind of alcohol culture in Japan, the alcohol history. Um, you know, uh, right now in 2017, I think even like, you know, when it comes to, for example, whiskey, most whiskey aficionados and whiskey writers and, 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 and scotch writers will will even, you know, freely admit that, Basically, now some of the best whiskey in the world is coming from Japan. Mm, um, yes, know, the best Scotch whiskey is coming from Japan, with a lot of you know Suntory and other you know Nika and different companies you know you know winning a lot of awards around the world. Um, you know there, there's this history now, mind you, something like beer is 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 playing catch up, and it, obviously it's going to take some time to catch up with places like America, where the craft beer scene is just incredible. Um, but you know, you're, you're touching on something here that's dear to me, and oh. it's the advantage of a that Japan has in sake. Uh, so I want to speak to this. Uh, well, yeah, I, I was just going to kind of touch on the. the I was going to ask you about the whole uniqueness of sake, but you, I'll just I'll let you go where you're going to go. <laughs> I I love the alcohol trade, and I like tasting other kinds of alcohol. Although all of them tend to give me stomach problems or headaches. Nihonshu is the one alcohol that doesn't give me any problems with a hangover the next day. Okay. As long as I'm drinking water through the evening and I'm properly hydrated, I can wake up and feel great. Mm. But uh, with respect to what you said about whiskey or beer and even wine, it can be debated where the best of these products are made. And in blind competitions, the wine of France or the wine of you know, California or Oregon, the beer of Czechoslovakia or Germany or they all compete very closely with each other. And it yeah. can't be said that one region is better than the other. But with respect to Nihonshu, uh, Nihonshu made in Japan is light years ahead, in my opinion, of sake made in other countries. Oh, okay. I've, and, I've actually, I've never even had sake made in another country. I've only ever had Japanese sake. Okay, yeah, sorry, continue, continue. So most of the sake in the world is naturally made in Japan. Mm. There are mm, about 850 active sake breweries in Japan. Around the world, outside of Japan, it's difficult to pinpoint a number, but my wild ass guess is going to be about 30. Oh, so, wow. That's it. Okay. That's it. So there's some sake being brewed in Brazil near Sao Paulo. There's a brewery in Australia. There's a brewery in Taiwan. Uh, there's there's several across Asia, but they're they're all smaller operations. And although they may be very craft, and there's a what I would call a micro sake brewery boom, where you have a small operators making just a little bit of sake in the United States, uh, they don't have the access to some of the quality raw ingredients. First and foremost is sake rice. Uh, there's maybe 300 strains of japonica rice, and you need the japonica rice to make good sake for how it's actually composed. And of these types of rice, they're not naturally grown in other parts of the world. Okay. And in this special type of rice called sakamai, there, are, there is rice that's grown in Japan that's made specifically for sake. So it's not necessarily, it's not rice that you would call table rice or rice that you can eat. Okay. And what makes sake rice different than table rice is that the inside part of the rice has something called a shimpaku. It's a starchy center. 
and it's the starch that makes for delicious sake. And part of the brewing process is that you have brown rice and you polish that rice down. It will be in a two story tall vertical rice mill typically. And by making the rice smaller to 70% to 60% to 50% of its original size, you're removing impurities that exist on the outside of the rice. And on the inside of the rice, you have just pure starch. Uh, you can make good sake from table rice, although the best sake is typically not made from table rice. And it requires a lot of technical expertise from the master brewer or the toji to do it. And so coming to Japan, if you really love sake, this is where the heart of sake is, even though it's grown elsewhere around the world. And the big reason for that is the rice. Mm -hmm. So do I'm going to assume then that the sake breweries would have contracts with rice farmers uh, and you know agriculturalists um, in different parts of Japan to produce rice specifically for them. Would that be correct? That's that's half the story. The other half of the story is that uh, well maybe that's one way that sake rice gets to become sake. Sometimes brewers are actually growing their own rice. Oh, so okay. the sake brewery will grow their own rice. And then the third way would be making, uh, buying rice from the Japanese co-op, a uh, JA co-op. Okay. Uh, I'm blanking out on their official name, but you can go to the rice co-op essentially. That co-op acts as the intermediary between rice farmers and the yeah, sake brewer. JAA, the, uh, I think it's the Japanese Agricultural Association. You see them in yes. all the rural areas. They have a little shop set up and this and that. Um, yes. And then, so, so then a lot of breweries would have their, essentially have their own farms. Yes. Okay. Wow. Okay. Wow. Interesting. Neat, neat, neat. I, I did not know that it was a different type of rice. I mean, just my own ignorance, just, you know, for me, like, rice is rice, right? And no. Yeah. The and case. the difference, it's like the difference between champagne grapes and grapes that you would get at the supermarket. Mm. Um, you, you can make sparkling wine from the grapes you get at the supermarket, but it's not going to taste like champagne. And that's how I like to explain sake rice versus table rice. Mm, wow. 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 So, okay. Um, you know, I'm, I'm curious, um, you know, a few things that I'm wondering about, um, for example, you've already mentioned about the quality, you know, the, the differences in quality in sake. Um, now you, you know, you said that just basically a small percentage of it, uh, 20, 20 something percent is the quality kind of grade A type things. And the rest is maybe not so quality. Um, how, how does one purchase quality sake? How does one purchase really good sake? How, how do we know where to get it? This is difficult outside of the U.S. Uh, it's because that uh, sake doesn't age well. Regardless of the quality, sake doesn't have um, preservatives and it doesn't age the same way beer doesn't age well. So it's best to enjoy sake within a year of its being bottled and shipped from the brewery. Okay. There, there are exceptions to this rule, but to give consumers advice on how to buy good sake, they should look on the label and learn how to read the Japanese dating system. Um, you know, some of the, if you're outside of Japan, you're not familiar with the Heisei dating system. So if you're at a supermarket in the United States and you see what might be the year 25, you don't know what that means. Uh, and so oftentimes the sake that's exported, they're not bothering to put a Western style date on the bottle. So it can be a bit of a mystery. When was the sake actually brewed? If it was a fantastic sake when it was six months old, when it's three years old or four years old, it may have gone south. Mm. And so it's difficult for consumers to learn about this because they're not properly educated. Of course, of course. So, so the first thing is making sure that you can identify a date on it. The second thing is that sake suffers from light strike. So light strike is when sunlight or ultraviolet light or any kind of light enters the bottle. Brown and green help protect the sake from this, but beyond that, um, if the merchandiser at the supermarket has the sake exposed to light for too long, there are trace amounts of manganese and iron that were present in the water, 
And with the exposure to this light, the flavor, aroma, and appearance of the sake will change. And so finding sake that's in a dark bottle or in a box or wrapped in newspaper, uh, if the sake has been protected like that, then that's a good sign that a consumer can buy it. Wow, I so didn't that, know that. that. That's some of my best tips for buying sake. Uh, depending on where your listeners are, there are really quality importers and distributors that care about educating and stocking sake. Uh, but at the local sushi restaurant where these, where your listeners might live, if it's outside of Japan, mm -hmm. you're really rolling the dice on this. Uh, some American consumers, for example, are drinking Gekekan uh, or Ozeki, but it's actually brewed in California. And although it's not terrible, it's not to be confused with premium sake. They're not making it with uh, premium sake rice, and they're making a lower quality product for consumers that aren't very educated about quality sake. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I suppose like when I talk to my mom and dad who live in, um, in you know, eastern Canada, and they live in a kind of a small, a smallish city outside of the capital, Ottawa, and, and they talk about how, you know, at their local... Um, and I know in the province of Ontario, we call it the LCBO, the yes. Liquor Control Board of Ontario. That you know, they buy. They sometimes they'll buy like little bottles of Swan, uh, not Swan Otsuru, uh, Hakatsuru, because I, I think that is one of Japan's biggest producers, is it not? It's the largest producer. Oh, it is the largest. Okay, so that's why it's that's why they're able to buy it in their their city of fifty thousand people in Canada. Yes, <laughs> because it's the largest. Okay, it is pretty damn big, their facility. I've been there a few times, and it's just amazing the amount of tanks they have um, versus, like, the, the one next to where I work called Suwanotsuru, which is uh, a lot smaller, um, and it seems more um, craft-like, <laughs> I yes, suppose. Yes, yes. Um, so, so, okay, so, uh, you know, you, you don't want that stuff exposed to the light, um, so it's that, I, I guess that explains to me why it's, it's most often when the large bottles are all brown, uh, brown yes. glass or green, dark green glass. Um, and so if, if someone is displaying it out in the, in, in their front window in the sunlight, maybe not the best thing to do, huh? Yeah, I agree to that. Um, sake can look beautiful in a blue bottle or a clear bottle, but blue and clear, they offer no protection from the light. And so a consumer should be careful about that. Um, mm. the, the other thing I might mention about sake, uh, if you want to go to a supermarket, you can buy good sake in major cities in the United States. But the unfortunate thing is the price is much higher than what we would pay for in Japan. Mm. So I can just from my own experience, I can spend 1500 yen for a 720 milliliter bottle in Japan. And that same sake in the United States at a supermarket, the markup might be four or five times, if not more. And so it's still a special beverage to purchase, and you can equate it to buying a good bottle of wine. Um, one of the benefits it has versus wine is that unlike wine, after the cap is opened, there's oxidation that occurs with both beverages. But because there's no sulfites in sake, it's possible to put the cap back on the sake, store it in the refrigerator, and you can go back to it much longer than you could with wine. So if people open a bottle of wine, they're thinking, well, in a few days, it's going to change so dramatically, there's some pressure to drink it. With sake, you might drink it within a week or two, but it's possible to have really amazing sake where it's been open for a month, if not longer. Oh, wow. Okay. Great. Folks, the, the flavor changes. That. The flavor changes, but it doesn't, in, in many cases, it doesn't make it undrinkable. Oh, okay. Wow. Uh, which is really interesting, I suppose. I mean, like, when I, when I visit, you know, Japanese people's homes, and especially if they're, like, older gentlemen living in the house, and they, uh, you know, they they pull out the bottles of sake. They, they, they ply me with beer, but then they pull out those bottles of sake from the fridge, and they're like, here, drink some of this. Oh, are you there? No, you came back, Kevin. Oh, Okay. Cool. You left me an older gentleman in the house. Okay. Hey, folks. Sorry about that. Um, sometimes Wi-Fi can be an issue. Um, yeah, you know, I was just saying that, like, you know, sometimes when I, I visit Japanese homes and I'm being plied with alcohol from uh, older Japanese gentlemen who live there, they, they whip out, like, a big bottle of sake from the fridge and they, they uh, pop that cap off and they're like, here, drink this. 
Um, yeah. Those those can end up being fun and ugly nights all at the same time. <laughs> And one thing I do remember, I got to admit, when it comes to sake, and I haven't seen this in a long time since I've I've been in Japan uh, going on nine years, and um, some of my fondest memories is uh, are of of this neighbor. I live in kind of a small neighborhood of a little local shopping mall, and in the summer months there was like a little shopping center, and all the old chaps would go in there to to get to beat the heat, and there were a few little public benches near a hyakuen shop, and often. I would see these old guys in the summer, and they would have the big bottles of sake, um, the big brown bottles. Like I don't know, yes. what are those? Like three, four liter bottles. Well, the, the, there's something called a nisho bean, which is a 1.8 liter. That's typically the largest bottle. Maybe, maybe can... that's what it was. It just looks bigger since it's a glass bottle, and they would all have like little Dixie cups, little paper Dixie cups, and they'd be they'd be all happily laughing and passing that around. And uh, it was always entertaining to see the, the old guys having such a great time. This is um, a strong conception about a, a misconception about sake is that it's an old man's beverage. Mm. And th this story has been played out in the minds of many people. And one of the challenges sake has locally, I should say, in Japan is that it's seen as an old man's beverage. And so one of the challenges for the trade is to encourage younger people, especially women, to actually drink it. Mm, um, okay, well, my, my apologies for... for uh, oh, no, that's okay. Help, helping yeah, share offended. that. <laughs> but but uh, I, I suppose that's is... true when you think about it. When, when I talk about sake, when I, when I mention two of my colleagues, I do work with a lot of, of Japanese uh, colleagues. And when I do mention that, I like drinking sake from time to time, they're usually very taken aback by that. Sake is only 6 or 7% of all of the alcohol consumed in Japan. So every other kind of alcohol far outstrips it in terms of popularity. And it's not seen as something that younger people or foreigners would have an interest in drinking. Mm. And I really want to help change that. <laughs> and that's why I have you on this podcast, because I want more people to drink sake. <laughs> No, no, but There's I mean, some... but I mean, but honestly, it is something that I, I, I mean, like I mentioned before we started recording tonight, I've been wanting to to do an episode of the Just a Fan podcast about sake because it is such an important part of Japanese culture, history, and but but I'm just gonna be honest, I I maybe I haven't had the premium stuff, but I think it's a really delicious, nice drink. Yeah. There's some things about it, regardless of who made it that should be interesting to people just from a technical point of view, one of which are amino acids. Um, amino acids in alcohol, um, they help create uh, nutrition for the yeast during the fermentation process, and this creates for wider flavors and deeper aromas. Mm. Nihonshu uh, sake has 20 amino acids. Wine only has 14. And beer even less. So there's a wider variety of amino acids available in sake more than any kind of alcohol. And these amino acids, like I said, they help create interesting flavors and aromas that might not be available to people who are drinking hot sake from their local sushi restaurant. So in enjoying sake, I like to encourage people to drink it from a white wine glass, um, a tulip style glass, or something that might catch the aroma like a Bordeaux style glass and to serve it chilled. And if your listeners are thinking, oh, I want to go buy a bottle of sake, they should look for Junmai Ginjo, in my opinion. Uh, this will have, by and large, a fruity aroma. And since some people are used to drinking sake from the small ochoko, the little cups, you're not able to capture the aroma of sake in the cup like that. So drinking it in a wine glass, I think, is an excellent way to introduce people to sake. Another thing about sake is uh, something called esters, and esters are um, naturally occurring components that create aroma in the fermentation process, and they have identified 200 esters in wine. However, sake has 400 esters. So there is some complexity um, in aroma and taste that can be found in sake that are missing in the winemaking process. Mm. Wow. So, where, okay, oh, I mean, um, amazing recommendations, advice. I mean, uh, I didn't know that 
having a hot sake kind of diminished the quality of it. Um, it not, not in every case, but for people outside of Japan, the sake that's typically being served uh, at, a, at a high temperature, like at 50 or 55 degrees centigrade, uh, it's typically not of, it's not premium sake to begin with. Inside of Japan, there are many sakes that are best enjoyed at that temperature. Mm. It really depends on the style of sake that you're actually heating up and okay. how it's actually being done. If you do it at home in a microwave oven, that's not optimum. But if you're going to warm sake, uh, you might put it inside of a the, the container that we call a tokuri, ceramic, and then you might have a pan of water on a stove and then slowly heat the sake inside of the tokuri into that pan. And when you can grab the neck of the bottle, if you will, or the tokuri, it's like a carafe, if you will, if it's almost too hot to the touch, that's when you might want to pull it out and then drink the sake from that point. Okay. But putting it in a microwave oven is not optimum. Yeah, it sounds like, yeah, I think putting booze in a microwave oven, just not a good idea, right? <laughs> no, no, not a good idea, which is why a natural way for beginners to get into sake is to drink it chilled, drink it from a wine glass, and pay attention to the aroma. Okay, okay, great tips there, folks. Make note of that, just... Japan podcast listeners who want to to drink some sake, um, yeah. Now, I, okay. So I, I'm curious, um, you know, sources of information. If people want to go out there and, and learn more about sake, what where would you suggest they go to learn more? You know, they're sitting in America, they're in Canada, they're Australia, they're in Europe. Maybe they're here in Japan. Um, and they're not Japanese, and they want to learn more. Are there some some good online resources to learn more about sake? There are. Um, the Sake Service Institute has published a lot of free information. Uh, Japansake.org.jp uh, also has a lot of good information in English language. Uh, there are several books written by authors from Philip Harper, who is a British-born master brewer uh, working in Kyoto. Okay. To John Gartner, who uh, teaches many people about sake. Uh, you can find good information written in English just by doing a casual web search. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't say I'm writing a book. And if you're... I was actually, I was actually going to want to... I was, yeah, I was going yeah. to ask yeah. you. I was going to ask you the exact question. I hadn't sent you. I was like, you know, are you writing a book about this? This would be something you should. Okay, continue. Absolutely. Talk about this. The, the, the book is mostly done. However, I'd benefit from having better pictures to help communicate the story of sake. Okay. Uh, but I, I want to just mention my Twitter handle. Oh, it's please at, do. at Gordon, G-O-R-D-O-N, Hedy, H-E-A-D-Y. If anybody has questions about sake or wants to get some free information, I'm, if they tweet at me, um, I will email them or make available to them otherwise some of the free information I've gathered about sake over the years. Yeah, absolutely. So, like, uh, of course, you guys out there, Just Japan podcast listeners, you know, when you go to the show notes at justjapanstuff.com for this episode, I will put all these links in those show notes so you build a contact Gordon. And we'll mention it again in a few minutes. Um, and I'm going to ask Gordon to send me some of the links he, he's mentioned to the uh, to those um uh, information resources, and I can post those in the show notes. So, in, in the on the web page for the for the show, I have I always put all the the linky linkies. Um, um, but yes, you got go, it. You got to You got to go follow Gordon on Twitter. So definitely do that. Um, so I'm I'm curious. Um, you know, as far as as uh, sake goes, are there any ones that are your favorites? Well, the sake I helped brewed really sticks out for me personally. Uh, the brands uh, are famous in their local regions, and sometimes they can be found around the world. Uh, last winter, I worked at a sake brewery famous for the brand called Kozaimon. That's a K-O-Z-A-E-M-O-N, and it's available in, I believe, over 30 countries around the world. And I went to that brewery, again, not looking for a job, but I went there because I thought it was one of the best sake breweries in Japan. 
and it ended up working out that they invited me to help brew sake. And then previous to that, there's a brewery in Fukuoka called Waka Takea Shuzo, and their sake is more difficult to find outside of Kyushu, although some of their older aged sake, which is really delicious, can be found in a San Francisco and New York. Oh, nice. So I like these breweries, but uh, so much of it depends on what you're looking for in terms of taste. And there are different styles of sake that I might speak about. And some of my favorite are unusual sakes that maybe aren't the best for beginners, but for somebody who's been drinking sake for 25 years, I'm looking for something more complex and more rare. And I might take a minute to mention some of these styles or some of these breweries to you. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. So for people living in Japan, uh, I find uh, that sake from Uahara Shuzo, um, this sake is really delicious. Uh, the brewery is in Shiga Prefecture, and the popular brand name is called Furosen. And for almost all of the sakes, I find this really unusual taste that the Japanese call uh, koku ga aru, and it's like an earthy taste. And for me, this special taste, it almost tastes like a malted chocolate that I can find in their sake. Mm -hmm. And I've had maybe 10 sakes from the brewery, and I'm really wild about that brewery. Um, another brewery closer to Tokyo in Chiba Prefecture um, is called uh, Haku Kyoko. And this sake, uh, especially their raw sake, Sake is usually pasteurized twice to keep it shelf stable, but I'm a big fan of raw sake. It has a natural effervescence to it, and it has a really powerful mouthfeel to it. They have a really wonderful sake that is actually raw, and then it's made in a method called Yamahai. And for some of your listeners who think that sake that they've had before is too weak in terms of its flavor profile, maybe they're more of a traditional whiskey drinker or they like more masculine drinks, I would recommend styles such as Yamahai, Kimoto, and Bodai Moto. Uh, these three styles of sake are how we create the starter batch, and they okay. tend to have more acidity. They're harder to find, probably off the top of my head, about 5% or less of all the sake made in Japan is made with one of these three styles, but it has a nice punch to it. They pair better with grilled foods, with typical tavern or izakaya food, and they also pair very well with cheese. Maybe my favorite thing to have with sake is cheese. Mm. Uh, there's a really nice marriage with sake and cheese that most people find really impressive. Nice, nice. Cool. Wow. Awesome. I mean, uh, uh, well, I want to go buy some sake, but the only thing open right now are convenience stores. So maybe, <laughs> maybe not the best idea. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're really in the heart of sake country. Oh, um, I, yeah. Yeah. Kobe is pretty sweet for that. Yeah. Most of the sake in Japan is actually made in Kobe. Yeah. It's, it's quite a hub. Um, so uh, it, for all of you out there, guys listening, you know, I live in Kobe. Um, and if you visit Kobe, I can't guarantee I can give you a tour because um, I've got a tight schedule, but there are walking tour maps um, and you can do this amazing Kobe walking tour of the sake breweries and uh, it normally ends up ugly for me um, <laughs> when, when I do that because because it's like literally like I'll, I, I end up going with a group of people and we start at one and then we get walkers like, all right, and and... <laughs> I'm I'm sure you're not a fan of the one cups. <laughs> oh no, uh, they they have their place. The, um, but but it, the, but the sake breweries, even the small ones, have their own little small like like individual one cups. Oh, absolutely. Even good sake breweries will do this. It's really it's a great way to go. And that's like what we'll totally do is like we're like okay, we go to this what, the first sake brewery and we get the free samples. We go to the museum and you get the free samples and you do the tour. And they're like, well, it's uh, two kilometers to the next brewery. <laughs> Guess yeah. We, guess we need a walker, <laughs> and you get that, that kind of one cup. Um, but I mean, I you know, I, I, you know, I, you do have the one cups that are not the best quality, of course, though the the, the literal one cups. Um, I think the the name brand. I'm not sure who makes them, but um, you know, yeah, the the literal one cup um, was actually created by Ozeki, 
And this sake brewery made the first one cup sake in 1964 as a way to commemorate the Tokyo Olympics. Wow. So if, if you guys are wondering what a one cup is, it's essentially like a, like a glass cup filled with sake with a pop top. And you can literally just buy it anywhere at any convenience store and pop that top off and there you go. You got some sake. Um, and I have to admit, I used to live in Korea. I lived in Korea for five years in the early 2000s. And we, when I would come every year to Japan for a visa run, it was always exciting to be able to get a one cup. Yay. And just kind of like walk around the streets like, I'm drinking a one cup of sake. Ha ha. Um, yeah. So <laughs> in my youth, I, you know, I, I didn't know any better. I didn't know any better. Um, <laughs> ignorance is bliss. Um, okay. So again, uh, one more time. Um, how can people find you on the social medias? Can you sh- shout out your Twitter again for us? Gordon Hetty at Gordon Hetty. Okay, cool. And there will be a link in that uh, to that, of course, in the show notes, folks. And you are working on a book. Yes. Awesome. Thank you for thank you for mentioning this possibility. And when the book is published, oh. I'd be glad to come back on to your show. And I'll be more than yes. happy to have you come back on. Um, because I'm all about promoting people who do things like that. That's uh, a big part of, of of what the Just Japan podcast does. It's all about community. So when people are producing books and, and different things like that, I definitely want to have them come on and, and talk about it. You're kind, Kevin. You're very kind. I'm, I'm grateful for your time, and I know it's oh. coming to an end. But there's um, one thing I wanted to leave with your oh, listeners please, about sh- sake. Share, um, share. I really think it's the heart of Japan. It's the soul of Japan. And it's not as a popular of an export as Sony or Nikon or all these other fantastic products that come from Japan, but it really gets to the heart of Japanese culture. And it's ancient. It's ancient in a way that really staggers the imagination. And I'll give you two examples of this in closing. The oldest sake brewery has been in continuous operation for 55 generations from father to son. And this sake brewery is called a a pseudo honke. It's an Ibaraki. And it has been in operation since the year 1141. And I think that's really impressive that this beverage is being brewed in the same building. using the same water for so many hundreds and hundreds of years. And if 55 generations isn't enough, there's actually a famous shrine in Shimane prefecture where the head priest at the shrine called Saka Jinja, um, this head priest is the 65th consecutive son to assume the role from his father. And he's been doing it in his family for 1300 years. So, there's something tangible about Japan's history that can be found in sake that cannot be found in Toyota or Hitachi or all the other exports that Japan has. And uh, as somebody who used to work in the brewery, um, who watched how difficult it is to brew, where my coworkers and the master brewer might work for six months without a day off, uh, I really respect the people that make it and the people outside of Japan, your listeners, if they want to find a way to appreciate or honor Japan, sake is brewed in all 47 prefectures. And it doesn't matter where it comes from. You can find delicious sake anywhere. And I want people to enjoy it. Give it a shot. Awesome. So, folks, get out there and buy some sake. It's, uh, yeah. Then I'm, again, I'm not going to do it right now because I only have the convenience store as an option, and <laughs> that's not, not not always the best place to buy it. <laughs> that's where the low quality stuff is. Well, yeah. there's exceptions to the rule, but you're on the right track. Find yourself a good bottle shop uh, that specializes in premium local sake. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Well, Gordon, thank you for coming on the Just Japan podcast and thank educating you. us about sake. Awesome. I look I look forward to being in touch with you and I'm very grateful for your time and attention. Oh, no problem at all. Thank you. I want to thank Gordon for taking the time to stop by the Just Japan podcast and share a wealth of knowledge about Nihon Shu Japanese sake with us here in the Just Japan podcast averse Just Japan podcast land. I want to thank all you guys out there for taking the time to listen to the episode and download it. Hey, you're awesome, folks. You're the reason why I make this show. 
And um, you can go, of course, and find Gordon on Twitter at Gordon Hetty. So at Gordon Hetty. And the link will be in the show notes, of course. Go over and follow him on Twitter if you want to find out more information and learn more about sake here in Japan. Um, yeah, <clears throat> so that's it for this week's episode. Thankfully, in the interview portion, my voice was okay, but now it's not so okay. Uh, so what's going on? We've entered March. March is here. Uh, the plum blossoms are blooming. They're on their way out. The peach blossoms will be here soon. And at the end of the month will be the cherry blossoms. The sakura, the hanami. I can't wait. It's going to be awesome. Uh, I want to thank each and every one of you guys for following me on social media. Of course, you can find me on, on Twitter at jlandkev. Lots of great Japan-related content over on the Twitter feed. Go follow it. Uh, Facebook.com slash stuff. Lots of great Japan content over on the Facebook page. And there's a really fun community there. I've been really busy with the end of the Japanese school year. Um, I do work at an international school, but our school bucks the trend a little bit. And we actually go by the Japanese school year. So um, the last few weeks have been just absolute full-on panic trying to get work done. And uh, this week, anyway, I've had to put a lot of stuff on the back burner. I haven't been able to write any posts for JustJapanStuff.com. But that will be changing very soon. And <clears throat> you definitely got to follow JustJapanStuff.com because be, uh, there's going to be a ton of com- content coming there uh, in the near future. March is going to be just a wealth of content. There's going to be a, just expect a few posts a day there. It's going to be awesome. I can't wait. Um, I want to thank you guys for supporting the show, all the positive feedback you always send my way. Uh, you can always email me at justjapanpodcast at gmail.com. You can, again, find me on Twitter at jlandkev. Contact me on the Facebook page. Those are great ways to do it as well. Yeah. Um, I even have some YouTube channels, which I'll put links to over at justjapanstuff.com, uh, which I'm not very active on, but maybe I'll put something there over my March break. Well, everyone. Uh, that does it for another episode of the Just Japan Podcast. Remember, you can support the show by simply sharing the show and talking about it with your friends. Uh, when I tweet out a new episode or I paste a new episode over on the Facebook page, please share it or retweet it. That helps a lot. It really does. It brings new new awesome listeners like you guys on board. And uh, yeah, that does it for another another week of the Just Japan Podcast. I apologize for not feeling sounding so ganky. Right now, in the intro and the outro part of the podcast, but I'm not feeling very good. I'm going to be really honest about that. So next week's episode. Now, I know I think I was, I was sounding definitely better in the interview portion with Gordon, which I recorded a few days ago when I was healthier. Um, but <laughs> next week, hopefully, I will be sounding better. I will be sounding gankier and all of that stuff. More energetic. More energy. All right, guys. You are awesome. Uh, again, you're, you, every one of you out there who downloaded this episode and are listening to it, you're the reason why I make this podcast and, uh, I can't wait to make more episodes in the future, like next week. Ha ha. All right, guys, take care. Uh, my name's Kevin O'Shea. I am the host of the Just Japan podcast. I am a Canadian who lives and works right here in beautiful Kobe, Japan. <coughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a bit sicky. <coughs> so, uh, take care guys. And um, I'll be talking to you in a week. Wherever you are in the world, I hope you're happy. I hope you're healthy. Well, healthier than me. And I'll be talking to you real soon.